We have uh, Dr. Ted Selker with us today. Dr. Selker develops and tests new user experiences. He spent 10 years as an associate professor at the MIT Media Lab, where he ran the Context Aware Computing Group, co-directed the Caltech MIT Voting Technology product, Project, and directed the Counter Design Intelligence Project, product design for the future. His work is noted for creating demonstrations of a world in which human intentions are recognized and respected in complex domains, such as kitchens, cars, on phones, in email, and of course in maps. Ted's work takes the form of prototyping concept products supported by cognitive science research. Prior to joining MIT in November 99, he was an IBM fellow, directed the User Systems Ergonomics Research Lab. He has served as a consulting professor at Stanford, worked at Xerox Park and Atari Research Labs, and taught at Hampshire College, University of Massachusetts Amherst, and Brown University. He's here today doing a series of talks with various teams in the MAPS group, uh, giving feedback on our, our own user experience, and I'm glad that we have the opportunity to have this for all of us to hear from him. So, Dr. Zucker. Uh, thank you. This is um, a... Uh, topic that's really exciting, uh, and this talk's completely uh, new, uh, so forgive me. Um, first, I want to make sure I, I mention that I can't think of anybody that has made any group that has made anywhere near the impact on uh, making visualization valued and productive that this team, the, the Google Maps team, uh, has made in the last couple of years. Uh, I'm pretty intimidated. Uh, it's amazing, the direct manipulation, the, the changes to what we think can, we can understand and see and use and, and, and learn about the world uh, through, through this thing and how quickly. I mean, I don't know if you have 500 million users a day, but I wouldn't be surprised. Um, so um, anyway, uh, I guess that's, that's, that, that's where I come from. Uh, maps are... are um, are ver a variety of things, uh, and you know they go from this lovely. Um, let's see, is this thing? Oh yeah, this lovely you know visualization of you know how hard it is to ride on this bike ride, and 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 an overlay of the physical terrain uh, to things we call maps because they're just a, a representation of. of of something that will be spatial and have meaning. Um, this uh, here was a user interface for Alzheimer's victims that I made that's on PBS that is a map of, of applications they can use. So you know the word map uh, gets used in various ways, but it's about orienting ourselves in space and maybe time. Um, and certainly um, the, the, uh, the, the use of the spatial domain for communicating um, goes from imagery uh, to caricaturized imagery. I call that caricaturization. Usually things like icons uh, are, are, are caricatures of, of, of images um, and are, are used to, to bring out some aspect or make them memorable in some way, separate from being an EQ um, uh, object that is uh, uh, about a specific uh, thing and then symbols. Symbols are if you have to abstract uh, it to the point of having just a link. And and all three of those things are used in all visual languages and certainly maps um, uh, use 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 single symbols, icons, and images. Um, and uh, people basically in every user experience um, are trying to orient themselves. When we're in the jungle, you know, we've got our peripheral vision and we're like, we can check out motion really good in our peripheral vision and we can focus and that's what we do. So we're foveal animals and so we're used to focusing and that's why we do the search thing okay. But being oriented is one of the lovely things that, that, a, that a, a map is about. And certainly, um, as we think about search, um, we don't have, um, you know, we call it browsing when we're when it's all about being oriented. And we call it search when we're doing something focused. So, I think it's really a new dimension that's being added to the kind of way you guys deal with data, knowledge, whatever, uh, to to be working in the spatial domain. Not just uh, you know in terms of the physicalness of it, but rather the the semantics of of uh, overview, background, surround information being critical to to something. Um, <clears throat> uh, but. Separate from the spatial thing, 
although we can remember very well uh, a specific image we've seen, as I was saying earlier, uh, we're, uh, we're extraordinarily good at that, actually. Um, we remember things much better as sequences. And sequences in time, we call stories often. Um, and so those are kind of some of the, some of the elements. Um, notations always vary. I mean, this is a, um, a depiction of the rainfall and wind and, and, and daylight. The daylight's that big hump. Um, for part of the world and parts in various months and time of time of year and and time of day um, that I used in in choosing which mountains to climb. It's in this wonderful book called uh, Mountains of the World or something. And um, in using that book, though, I got in trouble because this map of Chimbawazu, or, no, oh, excuse me, Oritzaba. Oritzaba is a mountain that I destroyed a car on. Uh, I used this map to decide that I could just drive up this road. Well, that road, even though the book kind of said you should probably get, you know, Jose Romeras to ride, drive you up in his four-wheel drive, it looked like a fine road up to the, you know, about a couple mi you know, a mile from the, from the base camp. And so, so what if it was 13,000 feet? And uh, you start driving on it, and it's a network of hundreds of roads. And no one knows what they all do except for, well, I found some hitchhikers. But yeah, sure, I did put a puncture of the, the gas tank, and uh, we got out of it somehow. Um, and, but if you look at you know, these books, also found in climbing books, you'll see these very specific annotations all over these cracks. And they are kind of trying to look like what you might see. You've got these little. These little uh, rays coming off to the left, that means it's a left-facing crack. Uh, you've got these dots where there's an anchor and trees all over. What are those trees? Those trees are really important because those are where you tie in. Um, but you know, these specific annotations of vocabularies are very common to humans. Um, and maps um, uh, in, in, in specific areas take it to, to, to levels uh, at which, um, which are, are taken there for a couple of reasons. This one is an outsider's map. It was made by some, some stupid American. You know? no, nobody there made maps. They don't even speak Spanish, by the way, in their rights. It's in Mexico, but they don't speak Spanish. It's really out there. Um, but these were made that way because look at how much information is on that page anyway. So we're, we're trying to impoverish. The, the, you know, to make, the, make a really simplifying notation to reduce the amount of uh, uh, um, things that we have to put on there so we can overload the communication and get a tremendous amount accomplished. Um, those, the, you know, there's uh, about 12 different climbs. To climb every climb on that page would take three days. So just you know, give you an idea of, of, and what's wonderful about it is it shows you, this, this map's actually pretty good at being all you would possibly need. It knows you know where the problems are and how hard these things are and and so on. Um, and this kayaking map isn't as interesting, but it has it still has some some of its own notation. But space, you know, um, 3D used to be something we didn't use we, for for decades. We've had 3D capability on our on our computers, and and yet we have 2D interfaces. Before for decades we had 2D on them, and we had. 1D interfaces with the text line. You guys still have text line as your input to your, to your search system, your multidimensional thing. But one, one thing I'm kind of proud of that I did is we, we had an interface come to us one day at the uh, lab I worked at, and it looked like this. They'd gone to the icon factory and, and come back with a bunch of stuff. And I, I drew on a napkin something that much more like this. And uh, what I did is I made uh, the size, sizes different, the spacings different between things. I made them semantically grouped. See, there's the books and the manuals and software all together, and the networks hooked up to the computer. And, and um, anyway, so we uh, tested these two against each other. And what's interesting is for about 30 years, starting at BB, I mean, uh, AT&T Labs, people had tried to figure out, gosh, do three, does 3D help people over 2D? And actually hadn't had any examples, really quantified examples. This was probably the first one. And what was interesting, is that the first experiment, when you first try to select things on this versus this, it wasn't any faster. It got faster 
like a third faster after some experience. And so, in fact, this spatial uh, organization, remembering the spatial organization, in this case, using 3D space, different shapes, different sizes, actually was a, uh, a long-term memory result. So I think that's really fascinating. By the way, I bet you we got better data now. I bet you some of the user interfaces that haven't been tested enough out there today will teach us that actually you can do better than that. That there's things with animation, there's things with, with 3D um, effects that actually can help instantly. But in any case, um, there, there's at least reasons for going to, to more complex, more three-dimensional interfaces if you, if you have to do it repeatedly. When I was going to give this talk, I sent out a message to a couple of you guys. And Norvig came back with, the, with, with something excellent, and as he always does. He says, well, you know, think of it as a platform for adding data collected by uh, others. I mean, to be honest, a map always is a collective enterprise, OK? A map is a complex collection of information about a space. It's hard to imagine a map that could be made by one person by themselves. And, and, and really, you guys take that to an extreme, and, and are, 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 I, I, I expect taking it further. Um, and and you know, he said, well, what, what's the best value you, you can get? Uh, what are the data sources that are important? Uh, how would we display them so they're useful and discoverable? How do we build communities of both consumers and producers? And those are all really important thoughts to keep in mind. I think you guys all are. But I think what we're going to find is much more exciting than that. We're going to find that the social and physical space of the world is changing dramatically. You know, while we look at that grass out there, and certainly every blade of grass has all the information about grass, it used to be that that grass maybe was specific to Mountain View. Now it's flown around on a 747, and it's not specific at all. We've destroyed its sense of space. And 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 you know uh, autonomy or whatever, but but certainly um, we are giving the world uh, an archaeological record now that in the next two years is going to be so much greater than all of the archaeological records that have ever existed that it's going to change the way we think of every place and what we can do with it and even what kinds of uh, um, things we can we yeah we tools we can make. So I'm very, I'm, I'm very excited about that. Um, and there's you know, these techniques that we can use. Um, and uh, this one I picked up off of your website a couple days ago. Dave told me to check out this, this, this picture thing. It's really god awful. I mean, <laughs> it is impossible with this thing to use it either as a map or a picture viewer. Um, but it's lovely. Um, and then there's all these overlays. And, and I just have to start. I start teasing you guys. You know, um, I, I'm not sure where to start. I'll start with one place that I'm very, very excited about with these pic oops, pictures. Um, I was in Barcelona at this university, whose name I'll forget, two, two weeks ago. And, or maybe it was a week ago, I don't remember. Anyway, um, 29th of May, whatever that is. And this guy showed me this amazing visualization with pictures that were geolocated that he'd found himself. And some, actually, he's a graduate student. And what he did is he simply um, had a you know, colorized map of where the pictures were. And you could literally tell where all of the tourist traps in town were. It was just absolutely obvious where, those, where were the places you needed to go and take a picture, right? You, know, you can imagine you know, those spires of uh, Gaudi's and that park that Gaudi made and the ocean front. It was just all very obvious. And beauty, I mean, I thought that was really lovely. And the question becomes, what is the value of all of this information? The fact that those pictures exist all by itself was the information that was so, so important to me, the tourists coming through. Maybe if I was over here and stuck in, stuck in Mountain View, I'd want to look at all those pictures on the ocean of those girls not wearing any tops or something. But, um, but you know, in fact, um, uh, you know, that, that wasn't what he was pointing out. And, I think that we will get, and I know you guys, we're going to get to the point where these pictures are, uh, don't look like noise. They look like, they look like wow, that, because that's there, I understand so much more about that place and about what I would do there and why, I, why a person is there and what has happened there and what could happen there. And then we go and take a look at this, um, this, 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 this bubble, this balloon. And balloons, you know, they just completely 
What's really great about them is they aren't ignorable. They are not what's underneath. They are not. They, they, they stand out. They're separating themselves. Um, what happens when I put my cursor over there? Should it move away so I can look underneath it? Or should it really, really expand so I can see more of that? Um, in fact, that, that, that the semantics of, of the map versus the overlay you know, is, is, a, is a hard thing to get right. Um, and then we, we have all these things we want to do to our maps. We want to we want to like you know find our way around and and we want to add extra things and and you know when somebody was asking me well what if we add another thing how many things should we be able to add how many modes should we be able to get into and what does it mean when we get into a mode and how do we get out of it and and uh, it's really you know um, I guess Woody Allen is attributed maybe with with saying you know time is the thing that keeps everything from happening at once. Well, space is, you know, <laughs> you know, space has the same danger. If everything happens at once in space, it's just, it's just a big pile. Um, and yet, you guys do, 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 do an incredibly fabulous job of, of, of se separating stuff. And I'll, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as, as we go on. I'll just, yeah. Um, and so, you know, then I'm just going to, in the, in the, in this phase where I went and played with things and thought about what to say about what you guys do do. And I'm sure everything's you know, always improving as it does here. Um, you know, I searched for El Camino Real restaurant. And the reason I searched for that was because there was a specific restaurant I was trying to find. And I didn't know any other way of characterizing it. However, somebody has grabbed your search. And they've decided to put a sports shop as the first thing on my restaurant search on El Camino, Palo Alto. Um, and then I noticed that. Um, some of these things aren't even on, on El Camino. I mean, we're only th this is the fourth thing. And we're already at the YMCA, which isn't a restaurant either. So somehow or other, those, that, that search has gotten you know, derailed right from the very first four, four things. And I'm just kind of sad about that, um, although I don't think that has anything to do with maps. Um, but it's amazing how good you guys are at search. And why is it with extra information, um, some, of, some of that seems to have um, had some problem of some sort. And, and I don't know, probably you can explain that to me. So <clears throat> you know, when I, go to, when I go to directions, I found myself going back to a, a street. Actually, it's a stri set of streets that are the streets where the people that bought my house in, in, in Boston owned a house, so I could have looked at that. But that was like three months ago that I was there. And every time I go back to Google Ma uh, to, to look for directions, it always takes me back to there. And I don't quite know how to change that default. Uh, so you know, um, the memory is good. But um, remembering things, um, you know, our memories diminish over time, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately. And, and the question of how do we make these, these personalizations be much more like humans, where, where, uh, memories, where, where they are appropriate and fail soft is always an issue. So personalization, I think you know, you've know, you got to have conflict resolution. You've got to decide, gosh, do I really believe in this place that Ted went to three months ago as the starting location? Um, as opposed to today when I was looking at um, uh, mobile, and it couldn't quite remember that where I am might be the place that I want to start from, even though it knew that when it was trying to impress me that it knew where I was when I got the thing to come up. So, so you know, really deciding that stuff is, is, is uh, subtle and uh, important. Um, and it's important in setting people's expectations and then keeping them at that level. People don't mind if you don't do a very good job if you keep doing it at that level. But if, you're, but if the job that you do is spiky, then they don't know how much trust to give and how, how deep to make that, that, that commitment to, to looking at what you're doing. Zoom uh, granularity um, is, is, is something that I find myself spending minutes a day with on Google Maps. Um, I zoom in, oops, I'm all the way in and I can't see anything. I zoom out, oh, I'm not looking at the whole world. I, I'm, I'm just, I feel like it's, uh, I, I've got you know, poorly, poorly sharpened ice skates, right? And I'm just, I can't stop myself. There's no semantic limits. And I'll give you an example of some, a trick that we did when I was doing tactile feedback uh, with, with, the, with the pointing device at IBM. If you went slowly, you could feel the edge of a window and the edge of the scroll bar, and the edge of the internal window. And then you felt each of the pixels of the text as you went over it. When you went faster, all you felt was the edge of the window. right? And so when you went faster, you know, when you, as you sped up, it would change the semantics 
of what you felt with your haptic feedback. And I think that the question of how much, what, what a zoom feels like and how to zoom back to the level I was at before, um, you don't have to have these fixed, but you can have it so that there are energy wells, so that it's easy to get to various resolutions and that you are um, increasing the dynamic range of a person's control within the range of where they're working. And if you want to talk about that, I know a lot about control algorithms for, for user input. But I think it's a really important topic. That's why I wasted your time on it here. Um, and um, yeah, I, I find this, this scroll bar is just dimensionless in a way that it could possibly find some, where there could be some semantics. What, what does it mean to be whittling around on a street? What does it mean to be whittling around in a, in a community? What, what, what does it mean to be whittling around in a, in a, you know, right? I mean, what are these, what are those different levels and why would you be there? All right, and, 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 that, and yet people do want to have, you know, the freedom to, to explore. Um, point at here. Uh-oh. <laughs> I don't remember what that one is. Sorry. Um, point at here. I, I guess I probably have found myself getting, you know, trying to put something somewhere and, and, and the precision, yeah? I think I, I have a frustration that I think is like this, which is I want to know what this thing is. Oh, well, that's a really important you know, thing. I, I, I don't know what to search for to get a bubble on that thing to tell me what it is. I know you know what it is. So yeah. Well, well, that, point up here, what is this? Well, that's a you know, graphical search. Why wouldn't you have it? You know, it's such well, a. You, have it. it's just, it's just, you double click the center of the map and search for star to tell you, you know, what's there. But you know, nobody knows that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, right. And um, I think that that um, there was a topic we talked about quite a bit today, which is which I call self-revealing interface. And it's, the, and it's so hard, I'm looking at him because I know he's a tool builder, it's so hard to make tools that have, that have on-ramps that, that encourage you to get, to, get rid, to get deeper and more sophisticated with them without wasting your bloody time, you know, you know hanging it all around you and, and not letting you get your work done. And I think that that's, that's, that's a real holy grail for user experiences, how to get people to know that new functionality exists without dest destroying their, their, their competence in, in the process of, of learning them something. Um, yeah, that's actually what you did, that, what I did mean. Thank you, Chris. Um, annotation, I mean, I'm sure it's coming, but you know, when I look at the maps that I drive across country or ride a bicycle or go climbing with, they are cluttered with things that are mine, my personal annotations. And those annotations are all memory aids. That's what they are. They, they remind me of experiences. They remind me of people. They remind me of dates. And um, you know, there's no reason that you guys aren't figuring out even better, richer ways of letting us annotate. And I think that in the meantime, you know, you're busy making the rich ones. But I think that there are, are the, are the, that you should figure that maybe it might be fun to be thinking about the, um, the lightweight and simple. And, and probably you will figure out rich ways of getting rich information from them. Um, even, you know, it's just I'm going to go for this, yeah, whatever. Uh, replacing hand marking with menu. OK, so you know, when I'm doing stuff on the screen, I've got this hand that's moving around, OK? Well, a marking menu is this lovely thing, or pi menu, is this lovely thing that the direction you push your cursor changes the value of what you're doing. And it's very easy for people to remember directions. So whenever you see something that uh, is laying around not being useful, how many, you know, should it always be a hand? What are the other things that that hand can be? Why could it be, a how could it be changed to just very light, in a light way, give people more ability um, to control things. One thing we were talking about this morning is that nobody knows how to teach. Um, the, you know, if you know how to use the cursors to use the panning, to use, then if you're using the panning to use the cursors, well, you know, there's very simple things you can do. And where that's a very nice learning moment. When, when a person uses a control and there's another way of doing it, why not? As long as they're both visible, highlight the other one and show that it, it, it's also um, available. Um, and there's a 
cheesy example of, of what a Pi menu might look like. But semantics are hard. And my son loves to think about words, um, very much so. If you, anybody knows of a Latin class, he's in need of one this summer. Um, but so he, you know, you say Frisco CA, and it finds us uh, Frisco, Indiana. Um, so I'd like to get San Francisco, obviously. Um, and I guess you know. That's not a big surprise. Um, and I'm not always sure. I, I guess one thing we were talking about this morning is everything's attack. And uh, these tacks um, are, are, are the only information we have to deciding whether we're going to look at something more unless we look over there. And so that representation is completely necessary to decide whether this is valuable to poke at. And I think that you might want to figure, you know, it might be possible to, to not depend on a person looking on two representations and think about how you can maybe expand your vocabulary of, of, of annotation to simplify the person's decision of what they're, what they're looking at. What is what? I think you guys are probably are going to, you know, but this has probably got to be fixed, you know, easily. But you know, when I say 90 Jason Street, Arlington, Massachusetts, you know, uh, because it's in the what field, it seems to get me all these businesses. And I thought you guys were making money from this. I was told this morning you don't even make money from this. I'm, I'm, very, I'm sad. I mean, because it's like, then, then what's the value? It's talking about you know, 20 Academy Street. That's obviously not 90 Jason Street, nor is, uh, nor is 70 Park Avenue, um, although they know something about 70, 90 Jason Street, and so on. So, yeah, semantics are hard. That's all. You know. um, and a few years ago, my friend, uh, maybe some of you know him, Henry Lieberman wrote a, a nice paper kind of playing around with alternatives to zoom and pan. The typical thing that people do to get from one place to another is they, they come you know, zooming out and zooming in. right? And that's, that's how we typically do that, um, metaphorically. and. You know, and certainly it's a way of keeping oriented. But there are alternatives. And so he made something called macroscope. And <laughs> this image is a little hard to see, except that, let's see if I can, I'll go to the next one to show it more. But um, yeah, this is just not showing up so well. The point is, you'll see that there's freeways, there's street signs, and there's specific places. And this actually, if we had a better picture, would show three layers of resolution the country, the city, and the street and um, simultaneously. And we can use dynamics. Animation is a good way of separating these different maps. We can use intensity, colors, color intensity schemes. We can use texture. The texture look of a street grid is very different from that of a freeway you know, kind of interchange look. Um, we can use kind of Purple Mountain's majesty to make the one map kind of look like it's below the other one. Um, and we can use bounding rectangles when we, whoops. Um, oh, yeah, this one. Um, when, when, when we don't. So if you look at this, you'll see there's the world, right? And then um, in that world, there's a couple of places that are important. Um, there's, there's the United States, and there's some place that uh, in Cambridge. Um, in Cambridge, here's the map of Cambridge. Anyway, um, if you look at this guy's paper, he has a video also, um, that, that he's gotten you know, four layers of, of, of maps be able to be interpretable all at once. And it's interesting. You just look at them, and you find yourself just focusing at the world, and you don't notice so much Cambridge, right? And when you look at Cambridge, you don't notice so much the world. And, and that's an example of it. And, and you can use various, various visual techniques to do that. And it's, it's a lot of fun, because basically it gives you this, this you know, huge range of, of resolutions that you can pay attention to, uh, potentially. Um, the next slide or two are some of the maps. I, I over from kind of 1999 until it became obvious that you guys own the world of, of maps, uh, we, we made a bunch of things called Virtual Campus um, at MIT. And, 
it started off with me just wanting to make it so anytime you opened your laptop anywhere on campus, it would open with a map from where you were, where all the bathrooms were, where the free food was, where the lectures, the free lectures were, as a kind of a backdrop. And that that was our first uh, demo. Uh, and then we kind of kept playing with it, and I'm not sure it got better, but anyway, we kept playing with it. Um, and so, you know, the idea is that if you're a staff, you might see where the where the um, um, the, the, the the closets, you know, the power. You know, connectors and, and stuff like that were, uh, and, the, and the, the circuit breaker switches. If you're a, uh, a student, you'd know where your, you'd actually, it would know that your chemistry lab had moved, and you could see where it moved to. If you were, um, you know, um, a, somebody outside of the university and it was the weekend, it would show you that there's a, that there's actually a bathroom over at the Legal Seafood. It wouldn't show you that there's a bathroom inside of the media lab because the media lab's not really something you should be going into when. Well, except when the museum's open. And if the museum's open, then it does show it to you. And so this idea of, of having right, the structure of, the, of, the, uh, of what these different spaces are, uh, are useful for and to who was what we exposed. Um, we had real-time shuttle information. And, and um, oh my gosh, we had our hands for a few minutes on the MIT data warehouse, which meant we knew where your car was parked. Um, and. Um, and we knew more than that, actually. We knew which classes you were in and stuff. And they thought that was OK. And we knew that they'd not after a while. And they, pretty soon, they got scared of us having all that data. But it was fun. Uh, and, and one of our tricks that really seemed to work out, there's a lot of ideas that we tried, was we had these 12 uh, different um, icons, I want to call them. And um, for the different things that, um, that uh, iCampus exposed. And it really was amazing. I mean, one day I, I wanted to go to um, some entertainment on a Saturday night. And so I popped this thing. I, I, looked, I looked in you know, the local newspaper, you know, the ones that are for, the, for entertainment and the, and the entertainment section of the Boston Globe. And I you know, looked on, online for what's happening in Cambridge. And finally, I just went to our map. And I went to our map, and I looked over at Kresge Auditorium. And there were three things going on that were interesting to me. And it showed them as entertainment. And we drove over there. And one of them was sold out. And the second one we went to was this African drumming thing. And this, guy, you know, this whole team of drummers had come from Africa. And it was like this huge memory for my kids. And, and we decided all that and did it in you know, 40 minutes. And it was a 30-minute drive. So, you know, so I was really kind of loving it, um, that it just, just really just, you know, Brought all that information together about that, and so these are you know this is sports and this is this is music and uh, here's some acting and here's some MIT um, event. Anyway, so there's these different categories. There's a Bulgarian dance workshop going over there, um, and this is a I think actually me, me and a guy named Scott per Penberthy uh, may have pioneered this kind of visualization and. 1985, when we made a, uh, uh, um, an overview and uh, um, in view thing, where you know you could stretch, the, you change the size of this, and everything in that block is what you see up here, and it gives you an overview and 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 focus view at the same time. It's pretty common kind of uh, uh, approach these days, um, and I think it's uh, useful. Um, but we tried all sorts of different maps, and the ones that worked worst. Um, were, um, you can barely see it here. We had ones where we were using, where we were, you know, when you went someplace, the whole world stretched, you know, it was a big, stretchy rubber, rubber world, and, and the building you were in got huge, and everything else got small. And that fisheye view is a lovely thing, but it's disorienting if it's not done in a way that people can remember the relationships between things. Because when they're stretching and morphing around themselves, actually the spatial relationships between them change. And people aren't really good at transforms, except when they have a model of it. And so I believe that if you can design physical models like Sphere or whatever to make it obvious what transform you're doing to a space, you'll be able to not break people's understanding of where they are. But boy, oh boy, we had terrible problems with, with that. Um, and. Uh, yeah, that was kind of a, the tragedy of, my, of Matt Hockenberry's thesis, is that he bet his, bet his life on that idea, and it did, wasn't working. Um, but it was a beautiful demo. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, I mean, just, you know, the, you're going to the world parts as you go forward, you know, and it's really great. Um, so the idea, uh, some, some of the other ideas that we tried in this thing that were really uh, successful was, um, darn it, none of these actually show <laughs> the one that we deployed. But anyway, the one we deployed, there was a couple of nice features to it. One is that there was uh, about a 20 pixel wide segment between the map and the rest of the screen, which we made kind of curved, just slightly curved, and green. And then there were some brown uprights coming out of it. And then there was a bezel around a big bubble. And that was always there. And so that was, it looked very much like a billboard at the edge of, right? And so that metaphor kind of made it kind of connect in with the, with the map. And we put all sorts of things there about the things that, you know, the more detailed stuff was up there. Um, and uh, another idea that I'm really kind of fond of uh, is that you, um, wherever you were, that's, that's, you know, your friends, right? The relationships dictate, of course, as I was telling you before, what you can see and who can see it, you know, and that's kind of interesting, duh. But we did another cute thing, which is we had this uh, IM capability where you could send messages, and I'm not sure I see any of that on here. Oh, I may not have copied that. Anyway, you have messages waiting for you underneath this person that's you, and it's a cute little person. And it can be in your dormitory, or it can be in your office, or it can be at the theater that somebody wants you to go to. So when you see a message for yourself somewhere else and you open that, it kind of already helps you understand that that's maybe something interesting that you might want to do, and it might be useful for you to kind of think about. All right, enough of that for now. I'm just going to talk about navigation um, for a minute. And there's so many kinds of ways of navigating. Um, and it makes a huge difference. And you know, we can talk about it from the point of view of you know, uh, stretching space and time, like the hyperbolic viewer does. Um, and one thing I was talking about earlier was this idea that if you put a grid that looks like a globe over a hyperbolic viewer, it makes it much more like a sphere. And the, the foreshortening on the edges makes a lot more sense. And you don't kind of have to go and kind of do some conceptual mapping. You do just a physical mapping. So I think the physical space, anything you can do that, to, to make people believe they're in a physical space is going to be something really easy for the mind to do. Um, but, but, on the, but on the input side, uh, I've done a lot of stuff. Like, like, for example, when you're scrolling, we made this scrolling device that if you just hold it in a position, you, go, you keep going in that direction. And it's kind of a lot simpler than, than doing this. In fact, it's a third faster than the, rolling, than the scrolling thing. But what Apple said to us as well, our brand's already working for us. Um, and uh, um, you know, there's kind of some fun, specific ones. We made this, this rope. And all we did is put that rope over the rolling ball on a, on a scroll wheel. And then you step on it, and it made the, and, 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 and on this rock that we made, and it makes the buttons click. And it was just amazingly, in fact, we went to some museums, you know, for going up into a jungle, you know, going down into caves, you know, going up into space, you know, going up into a, 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 big, a big building. It was kind of a really natural exploration device that, that kids uh, just loved. <clears throat> when we tried um, making six degree of freedom navigation devices, um, we started off um, thinking about, you know, how could we do a 6D of Creative freedom thing with the pointing device that I was so involved with. And um, we started off with these, right? We put these two, those two pointing devices side by side. And what was amazing is that when we offset them, you see the difference? These ones are offset. When we offset them so that they were asymmetrical, it was much better. People got confused about which one was which when they were, when they were, when they were symmetrical. And they would get the semantics wrong. People are very, very good at mirror image reflection uh, decisions. And so they would, they would screw up in that way. And um, then we realized that you know, the best thing to do with two hands is maybe move something into place and then attack it. You know, kind of like what you do with a, with a, with a, when you're drawing. You're moving the page underneath your hand and keep drawing. There's even tools for artists to, to, to to move, their, to move their brush around with one hand and do it with the other. We set things up with our left hand and we do them with our right if we're right-handed. 
And so that's why there's a blue button in the front of that uh, ThinkPad. That blue button is you push on that and you're in scroll mode. And that's your left hand. And so you know, thinking about these navigation metaphors and these navigation uh, affordances um, is useful. You know, so this is a 12 degree of freedom navigation device. No, it's 24 degree. Ugh. You know, it's clay. I wanted to make clay. I wanted to be able to mold things. Uh, a lot of work to sometimes. So <clears throat> just um, going to give you a couple of examples of, um, of things that I've made um, that are kind of about maps but aren't maps. Um, this is a helmet that I regularly wear parts of <laughs> when I commuted it in, at MIT in and out of school. And what, it, what it does, um, I could have brought it, um, is that when you're wearing it, it overloads uh, your, your movements with things that help you mediate the world outside and the world inside without taking your eyes off the road or your hands off the wheel. And so when you, when you put it on, the movement, the little bits of movement, the accelerometer picks up and turns on the running lights. And when you, when you um, yell, um, it covers up what you said with a, with a 130 decibel horn. And when you um, talk, it goes to the, this, uh, the, the, through the Bluetooth to your cell phone. And when you um, do nothing, it plays your MP3. And when you um, hear a loud noise outside, it actually shuts down that MP3 and amplifies it. And when you shake your head, it um, records whatever you said. Because you've just gone over a pothole or a curb or had an accident. And so then the next time you go back near there, it's going to say that again. And then, of course, you can overload that by doing a shake when you see um, a really beautiful piece of architecture you want to remind yourself to look at again. Or maybe this becomes a virtual map. Maybe this becomes the information that we're sharing with everybody. And then maybe you get known for being the guy that says cool things about that, that tells people about those spaces. Um, and um, maybe we take a picture even. I don't know. But certainly, the GPS coordinates are useful. We don't take the picture, by the way, in this case. Um, finally, tipping your head's blinking. Um, we also made a uh, postal truck. Uh, the Postal Service gave us a million bucks a year for a few years. And no one else is doing anything. So I made a, a truck. And I put like eight demos in it. It was really fun. But the one that's most relevant to this conversation is, do you know the postal trucks are running around with about one-fifth capacity most of the time? So what would I put in that truck? Well, you know, it seems to me that right now, I mean, isn't there a new iPod coming out? Right? What if I fill the, the truck with the stuff that I expect that that demographic and that neighborhood that I'm traveling in as a postal truck is going to buy and want delivered tomorrow? But I put it in today. Now I'm on the internet, and so I can just like Amazon can just say, hey, you know, I got another sucker that wants to pay an extra 10%. And now I deliver it today instead of tomorrow. And so with this, with this, whoops, 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 whoops. What happened? My gosh. Oh. Oh, oh. None of this. I didn't mean any of that to happen. There. Is it going to do that again? Humph. If it goes forward, tell me. Um, so, so this map has various information on it. What information should it have on it? Well, um, here's the map. In the middle of we have six cameras, and those cameras are all around us. But, but, these, but these things are like there's a hospice guy. Do you know that the Postal Service guys are like often the first people to find somebody that's dead? It's, what? Look at that. Humph. I bet it'll do it again, too. Um, and uh, there's these, these, these extra things I could sell. What about? Well, another one of our sponsors was uh, Kodak. So I said, hey, let's put a printer, a really high quality banner printer in the truck, too, so that people can download their pictures and, and, and have them delivered right away when they take a picture at a better quality than they could print at home. And so the, the, this kind of this, this, the value of space uh, becomes interesting. And I guess one question is, how many trucks should come to my house a day? Maybe none. Maybe only my car should come to my house, right? And it should just, when I'm going through the, 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 um, the, uh, the, smart, you know, the smart pass place on the freeway, it should just you know, take my laundry, dump my, my groceries and my, and my mail, and, and so on. But the point is that we can, with information, 
we can um, overload um, the value of, of location in various ways. That's all. OK, so uh, what are my location dreams? You know, um, I, I want to know where I am, especially relative to my commitments and what I really care about. Um, deformations of space happen in my head. I, I actually am very bad. I, I always find it a surprise when I look at a real map and discover that the distances that I thought were short were longer than they were and the other way around. Uh, but we do have internal maps that are, that are different. And yet the danger uh, to our memory uh, uh, capabilities of having deformed uh, uh, um, things that we look at uh, is that if we don't have a model for why they're deformed, we get very, uh, we can get, uh, we can get lost, because orientation and focus are the number one and two things in in all in all experience in my in 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 my view. Overlays and inserts are 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 definitely tools that we have to work with, and in that macroscope, they you know Henry kind of takes it to to some extremes. Um, and you guys do all sorts of it. And we were talking earlier about how, you know, when you put, you know, neighborhoods of San Francisco in, you use a different font. That's and it and it kind of and it's disrespectful of the roads that it's over. It's kind of crosses roads and stuff. So it really is saying, I'm not part of the map. I'm about the map. And when you have your user interface stuff floating outside of it, it is not the map. It is it is it is something that can control the map. And so as you think about all of these things that you co-locate in this spatial physical space, you have to understand how to differentiate them and when you're overloading a person's cognitive capabilities. I mean, because you know, it's really um, uh, a danger uh, if you don't, if a person um, uh, can't focus, can't get oriented, they can't, they can't, they, they, they get, they get dis distressed. Um, and um, you know, this Navigation of the interface um, is the number one frustration I have with Google Maps. And that is just that I, I spend, as I said, minutes a day trying to get the right resolution on maps. And that, that just shouldn't, shouldn't, shouldn't. It's an, e it's an easier thing to take care of than a lot of the things that you guys get so right. Um, previews, right? I'm about to do something. Is there a way you can do a little animation that can give me a feeling of where I'm going? So that I don't make the mistakes that I that I'm making so often, you know. If I, you know, if I if I zoom forward, I'm going to get about that resolution. Yeah, that's what I want. I continue the action. So that's a, that's that's what cartoons do. They'll often go out on. They run off the cliff and they run in the air for a moment, so you know that they're going to fall, right? And and you know, if you could actually get yourself back off the cliff before you fall, that'd be even nicer. Um, so, <clears throat> um, what can we do? We can do lots of stuff, you know. Uh, and obviously, um, you know, comparing things is something people like to do. I want to compare the resources. What is the, what is the gas consumption alternatives, and and the cost consumption, the cost differences, and the danger differences of of flying, driving, you know, swimming, walking, to do something. Uh, what what is the um, the wait time? You know, sometimes it might take a little bit longer on a bike, but I'm going to get all that exercise. You know, these trade offs are hard to are hard to come up with. Uh, the experience uh, differences that I want to think about. You know, what's the efficiency uh, predicted in real speed uh, and congestion? Um, <clears throat> so, you know, we have predicted we have predicted traffic delays, and then we have the real ones we're going to run into. Uh, we were talking about some algorithms today that I thought might even uh, might even um, destabilize. Uh, you know congestion. I mean, if you if you get if you give too many people the same information and they all do some this is the predicted thing, then you end up with everybody over there having a problem too. Um, so that's going to be a real uh, problem as this thing gets more and more um, uh, utilized. Is is what is your effect on the things that you're actually giving people information about? You're not going to change the weather, but you know things like congestion, you might. Um, you know, when my, my brother was saying, you know, I, he's, he's both a mountain biker and a, and a road rider. So he loves to know what the quality of the road is for both, not, not to say one's better than the other, but to know which, what he's going to use that path for. Is, he gonna, is it a single track? Is it a double track? Is it, is it just potholed to the point where you couldn't ride a road, road bike on it? Or is it a lovely place that you could actually hold a race? 
Well, certainly you guys are in a position to do a lot more. Uh, you know, you, I mean, when I, when I look at things on Craigslist, I'm always wondering how far it is I'm going to have to drive. And the next click is to go and figure out how I'm going to drive there. And that is a big part of how I'm deciding, actually, what I'm going to, where I'm going to, you know, what, what, I'm, what decisions I'm going to make. Um, in, in making lots of decisions um, of, of, of cost and distance and time, um, you guys could be exposing um, your map technology to various people and in various processes and various search situations. And I'm sure you guys have much better ideas about this than me, but it just seems exciting to me, too. And so you know, it's 3 o'clock. And um, I guess what I want to talk about is that you guys are making the future of tools. And tools are the things that make us more powerful than we were before we had them. They allow us to do things we couldn't without them. And the real, the real question of how they feel has to be on some level that they feel like um, something that doesn't exist. So here I am uh, walking around on a little, I'm more walking than climbing, on a, on a side of a glacier at base camp at Everest. But it's trivial because of the 747 and the yaks and the chrome molybdenum and the plastic sold boots and the, and the carbon fiber shanks in my, in my, in my uh, you know, um, hardened steel um, ice axes and the polypropylene, there's an awful lot of stuff making me feel absolutely naked. I mean, naked in that I could just do it effortlessly. And that's, that's, uh, that's kind of what we want to feel. We want to feel that deliciousness of simplicity. And the real question is, how do we teach people um, to, 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 to take on new approaches and make them feel like it's something they already, always could do and is so natural that it's something they can't imagine anybody not doing. And I think you guys are in a fa the, the most fabulous position of anybody in the world to, to make that happen in the broadest possible, possible ways. And I definitely appreciate you guys bringing me here um, to, to talk about those, uh, the things that I, that I've, uh, some of the things I've done in the mapping area. And these are just some of the prototypes I've made over the last uh, at MIT. Thank you. And I'm not sure what you were expecting. So please, let's just have a conversation. Yes? A couple of questions. Uh, to one at a time. You mentioned uh, uh, in the area of annotations that you'd like to build the annotate maps. And it wasn't clear to me if you were looking toward um, a, a lighter weight process that are existing by the apps, or if you just want to learn my maps. Oh, it's another thing I have to learn how to use, or it's That's not. It's a way of annotating maps. Okay. Now, how do I get to it? You click the My Maps tab. Oh, okay. How do I know that the My Maps tab exists? And why is it a different tab? Yeah. Oh, it's a mode. I understand. Okay, so that's how that's how I feel about modes. So you're like for something lighter weight or yeah. Stuff. I just I mean look, you know I I mean I you know earlier when they were trying to get me to use my uh, to to use uh, to use mobile maps, I like opened this up and I said, gosh, you know. Let's see. Here's where we are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> OK. And uh, I'd, I'd like to ask a somewhat related question. Uh, you also talked about the cursor for the right map. The reason we have the hand. Always the hand. The Only the hand, yeah. The closed hand. Oh, I didn't ever notice that it was closed or open. If you click, it gets closed. And those were introduced so that because people weren't discovering how to grab and drag. I see. Was the closed and open? Did that help? Uh, it helped a little bit. OK. But, uh, it, it wasn't clear to me that the uh, that sort of bullseye thing, uh, I wasn't sure how what you were suggesting was going to help people discover to drag the map. Well, there's a whole lot of other things that um, you, could, you could discover besides drag the map, right? Um, let's see. What do I want to do? I want to learn how to zoom. Uh, we, we can click a different click, and we can zoom. We can, we can, uh, um, we can pan. We can zoom. Uh, what else could we want to do at that point? We could want to select. We could want to um, expand um, that, that little, maybe make a map inside of a map. I, we can, once we have control over a spot or over space, we can probably overload it with a few interesting opportunities for, for a user that, that learns how to do those. So how would that bullseye thing help to do that? And the bullseye is you have, you know, you have um, uh, up and uh, up is zoom, and down is pan, and left is 
left is uh, make selection and, and right is, is, expand, is make an inset map, for example. And so now, even before you, um, before you do anything, if you do that gesture, it will do that action. And if you don't, and you, make, and you just do the normal thing, you cursor around, it does that. But if you let it sit for a second, up pops this teaching tool that teaches you that those, that those different options exist. Okay, the teaching tool sounds like a good idea. That, that's, that's the dream. I mean, and, you know, I, I'm not sure that at the level of granularity I've explained, it will work as well as I... And then the final thing I just wanted to mention, you, you, you gave an example of overview, overview maps. Google Maps actually has an overview map. We've, we've found that users in general didn't like it, didn't use it much. I think, is it now turned off by default? I, yeah, I think it's, it used to be maximized by default. It's over in the right corner. Right. Now it's off, and now nobody knows about so, it. Right. So you had it for a reason, I bet. And that reason was that somebody sometime enjoyed it, and it was useful for some things. What are those things? When is it useful and important? And the, you don't really necessarily want it popping up and popping away. But you want these, these important, I mean, you, it, you know, what I've noticed about Google Maps is everything. So much more is there than I ever would have imagined. And I mean, incredible, lovely stuff. However, you know, one question is, after you have so much, how do you expose it in a graceful way? And I can't imagine that that overview is never useful. I mean, I... I uh, well, I don't think it's never useful. Yeah, I, 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 I like it, but yeah. I, I can remember how to turn it on and turn it off. Right. Uh, the problem now is, is discoverability. Most of the time, it's it's not useful. At, at least well, 80 percent, you know, maybe 90 percent of the time, it's not. Well, what it's probably like. very useful when a person has zoomed out to the whole world. Isn't that a time when you, you, the guy's obviously lost? They've Actually, it's out. useful when somebody zoomed in and, and oh, has there's lost. another one. I bet both of those are important places to 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 re to like leave the last the last um, the last resolution you had as a, as a, as a little mark on this overview thing that you can go click on and get back to where you were. I think undo is 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 incredibly paltry in Google Maps, and I don't think it's that way because it's hard for you guys to do it. It's hard to know how to expose it probably, and maybe this is a opportunity to bring back that wonderful overview map. Mm. I'm just, you know, trying here. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, other thoughts or questions or things you wanted to think about? I, I did sign the NDA. <laughs> These poor people have been sitting with me all day. They, <laughs> they're sick of this. No. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, so earlier about how we are putting more and more information with layers. Um, you talked earlier about how we are putting more and more information with layers and layers, and it's all getting very busy. Um, do you have an, any good intuition on how we might be able to selectively turn off and turn on layers so that people can browse quicker? I mean, what I'm imagining is if I want to go to a restaurant that is close to a river or something, in a particular city. Um, I might turn on the waterway layer and the restaurant layer and find that very quickly as a browsing action. Um, and there seems, in general, people are very good at this, for instance, with books. Because you, you, know, you sort of open a book, you flip through pages, you find a figure or an equation that you're interested in, and then you read the text. What's the equivalent for maps, and how do you do that smoothly? Well, I think that this whole overview um, issue is one of those examples of a way of exposing it. Um, and the question of, of do I have a magic bullet um, is going to be the following thought. I was taunting you guys because you've got those buttons up at the top that are that. Are that. They're, they're turning on and off Wikipedia and photos and this and that. And you know, I can go down and there's a couple, couple selections. And boy, I, I'm sure you've picked exactly all of them. And those user interfaces are going to stay the same and static forever. Not. What, what those are is they're a stab at, at, at doing what you're saying. But I think that the idea of having layers that you turn on and off is extremely brittle, right? Can I remember it? Does it exist? Do, do they still have it in that UI? Oh, now they've defaulted it to off. I better go find that place to turn it back on. You know, all that, that, that no one wants to do any of that. So what you want to be uh, thinking about is one, Get, having a model of the user where you kind of have some intuition that this might be a useful thing for them now, and some graceful way 
of, of, of exposing the opportunities for things that are going to improve their, uh, that are going to give them the richness that, they, that they're uh, looking for. I mean, I spend a lot of time on a map looking for a street, looking, looking at the map. I do this on maps. After all, I get frustrated and I go to the index. I look at it in the index. Oops, I find out I'm in the wrong city. Yeah, I'm talking about a physical map. You know, I, oops, I have to move over to the next city. OK, there, there I found it. Now it says H3. So then I look over at the map, and I realize, oops, it's the map on the other side with the H3. On this side, it's only you know, M3. Right? And that, that, I'm just telling you about the process that I go through in a normal old map. Think about all of those misconceptions that I had as I was making those decisions and looking at those different layers. And the question is, I, I, what I believe is you guys have something much better than, than what I just described as a user experience. And you know, you know that you always leave your search, your search window open. It's, the, it's, the, it's maybe the gospel of Google, the search window rules or something. But um, except you have two or three of them, and they're different, and they're, oh well. But, but I, I think that that, you know, what are those gospels? How do you expose the things gently and 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 you know one of that ideas that's that's why I talk about that pie menu. By the way, they work they work up to about twelve. You know, and after twelve, you know, you gotta do other things. But you know, th there's there's a symmetry that people remember. That's a good thing. And we can just start loading in in what are the things that people are good at perceiving, uh, recognizing, uh, responding to, and how do we not use up all the visual real estate. There were some other things that I forgot to tell you about a couple of those maps that were about um, time. And you can even expose some things about time on, on maps. Um, so I think that you know, you're just going to start making a list of what, what are the priorities of, these, of, the, of the information a person needs in what situation. And can you tell whether they're in that situation or not? If you can, party on. And if you can't, well, then you've got a more difficult situation. I don't know if that's a reasonable answer. Uh, the other option is to, I'm going, I'm mapping this to something completely different that I built for myself that I use a lot, which is um, when I go look at a web page that is very complex, I often want to filter out content. So I will find a thing on the page and then ask my environment to show me all the other things on that page that have the same CSS class. And that's again a notion of layering information. So you could go back and apply this to the map. And for instance, point at something on the map and say, show me the layer that contains this and everything else like it. And that would be an intuitive way of discovering layers. I don't know how well that would work for a user who can see. I'm just guessing happily. Yeah, what I put on the screen right now is just this was a um, uh, menu uh, search system that we made where the priority of the results that came back were layered and, and higher and higher uh, um, contrast and, and also overlapping each other to, to, um, to highlight them. And there are a variety of techniques you can use. But I think that this, this, this um, notion you're talking about of filtering um, is inevitable on some level, right? It's, yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and we have to understand how to do it. And I think one of the crucial things that, that will probably save, save your ass is undo, right? Yeah. You get rid of stuff, how do you get it back? You know, and undo is so easy. It doesn't have any. It doesn't have a lot. Of, you don't have to remember where and how. You just, you just kind of, run in the other direction, and, yes. and uh, that that seems like a lot easier than than some things. And I don't know why people don't use undo more in user experiences. They used to not do it because, of course, it was expensive computationally and and memory-wise. But these days, you know. You can have infinite undo. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> any other comments or questions? Well, thanks for coming.